So the last 12 months was a bloodbath for the tech industry with more than 260,000 jobs vanishing. The worst 12 months for Silicon Valley since the dot-com crash. Recently, the tech industry was rocked by another round of massive layoffs. This left many in a state of surprise and stress, raising questions about job security and career paths in this post-COVID AI hyping era. And today we're joined by two data scientists who have first-hand experience with layoffs. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. I'm Daliana Liu. We have Susan Xu Chang. Susan is a principal data scientist at Elastic of Elastic Search. Susan is an international speaker uh, with talks at six PyCons worldwide. So Susan was laid off a couple of years ago, and then she was able to find another uh, very senior role. So we're going to talk about that later. Another guest here today is um, Sundar Swaminathan. Originally, he's from the U.S., but have been living in Amsterdam for four years. He has been in growth analytics for over 13 years at companies like Uber. And now he's taking a bold move to start his own consulting business for uh, marketplace startups. He recently launched his website at sunderswaminathan.com if you want to schedule a call with him. So today we're going to talk about how to negotiate severance packages, how to handle stress, identity crisis, strategies for job hunting post layoff, and how to reduce risk in full-time employment. Let's get started. So Sander and Susan, can you take us back to the moment of the layoff, how it happened? Uh, what did you feel at the moment? So just to give a, a bit of context, I actually got laid off twice in six months. So I'll walk you through uh, both of those. And the first one I had I actually mentioned to my employer a month before that I just felt like this wasn't the right fit. It was a seed stage startup, really great team, really good founder, but I was leading analytics and experimentation and just not the right place for me. And so when the layoff happened a month later, I joined the call with the founder and immediately our uh, director of HR joined and very instantly I knew what was happening. It's a pretty, pretty obvious. And, and honestly, the most challenging thing that stuck with me is that the HR person who, I mean, you know, we're a small company, so I knew her well and we were good friends. But it was her giving me the news and not the founder, uh, who I had also met, you know, when we when they were even thinking about the idea or, you know, I was super early on. So that stuck with me. And I know we'll get into the emotions and we'll talk about it. But I, I anticipated something like this coming because I almost like volunteered myself because I said I, I didn't want to be there. And the moment that was, that's what I remember the most is just the, yeah, the founder not having the conversation, the HR person. And it's not a bad thing. It's just what res it's just what stuck with me. The second time, yeah, again, I should have learned my lesson, but it's very hard to be an analytics and experimentation person that early in a startup. There's not always this the space for it. And uh, yeah, I just had a very challenging conversation with the founder again the week before. And so when they you know, called me into the room, there were, there were three founders. I, I knew exactly what was happening. I was also within my first month probation period. And so it was just a mutual, not a good fit. So again, what I felt there was actually less like emotions because I was just like, it, I just truly knew it wasn't the right fit. And so I was kind of, I was kind of happy to move on there. But yeah, those are my two experiences. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. What about you, Susan? Yeah, so I think at the time it happened, there were maybe a few people in a batch. So then I actually, someone messaged me on DM a few minutes just before my call. So they found out already what was happening and that they messaged me. And I think that I, w I was lucky. So I think I kind of went into the meeting knowing exactly what was going to happen just because they you know, they had like a whole batch and then I happened to get <laughs> the info, but I think it was still a shock, like similar to what's under mentioned. It was like a sudden meeting with 
you know, some HR partner and whatnot. So it should have been suspicious already. But I did happen to get a few moments heads up. But it was still a surprise because just not expecting that, right? Like, it's still a shock. Yeah. So what was the immediate action you took after those calls? It was actually messaging some of the coworkers that were affected and also those who may or may not have been affected and then also notifying my family. Yeah. What about you, Sander? Yeah, same. I, I texted my wife uh, so in the first layoff, sort of, I, I think I almost remember I was like, LOL, this is happening because I had already kind of anticipated it. So yeah. she's like, how do you feel? And I was like, oh, I feel okay. And the other thing too is the net. So part of the context for why, you know, I think we mentioned that I live in the Netherlands is the laws are very different and it's mm. actually a lot harder to let go of somebody. And so one of the first things that everyone has told me, and I would also recommend is you contact a employment lawyer and you just almost immediately have all of the conversations with the company negotiating your severance package, et cetera, go through that lawyer. And so that was the second thing I did after I told my wife was just yeah, immediately contacted the lawyer just to get that process started. Yeah. So did you each negotiate your severance? And what was your strategy? Because you actually had an employment lawyer, which I think it's a very smart move. So I, I think the timing was somewhere around June of 2022. And I was a, my son was due in August. And the good thing about, I mean, I mean, there's many great things about the startup that I worked at, but one of them was a really amazing paternity leave for being that early to start up. They had 16 weeks, which is one rare in general for a startup, but two, even in the Netherlands, it's pretty rare. So I knew come August, I would have August, September, October, November. And, you know, when I got laid off, basically what I said was, that's what I would like. Like I had a very vested interest in making sure I had time with my first kid. That was kind of my, not non-negotiable, but that was my goal was basically saying I'd like, you know, 16 weeks. And we ended up very close to that. I, yeah, I think I was able to get that. And they were, you know, they also had the incentive because otherwise it drags on the process and it becomes even more litigious. And I don't think anybody wanted to go down that route. So yeah, I, I negotiated. But, and for me, it was based on principle, right? They had agreed to give me 16 weeks paternity leave. I was about to enter a very interesting time in my life. And I, and I wanted them to honor that. And they did. So so that's where my you know whole perception going into the negotiation went. Yeah, I think companies usually have a standard package based on your tenure, and they might give you a uh, couple weeks um, salary. I think a lot of people are not aware you can negotiate a severance package and not just about the money, about like you mentioned, like healthcare benefits and also for immigrants, maybe you also need to have your visa valid for a certain amount of time while you're looking for a job. Do you think people can also negotiate that? So for example, oh, maybe have me on your company record for another few months while you're paying me? Did you have experience under? I didn't have with that because again, a, a huge advantage of living in Amsterdam is no matter mm -hmm. what, whether I'm employed or not, health insurance is $100 a month and that's it. So I have a huge advantage of that. The biggest thing I did have was I'm on a, a working visa. And so I have, if when I get let go, I have three months to find a new role. So what was actually more important for me is instead of doing that, I asked them to just basically during those 16 weeks, keep me on their payroll so that my visa extended, I would have then even longer to find a new opportunity. And, and to your point on negotiation, I think it's important to remember that while a company is definitely making it for financial decision, there's huge brand risk if they do it wrong. I think, for example, we've seen so many companies recently just be in the news because of how poorly they handled uh, a, a layoff, a severance, or how they treat their employees. And on the flip side, Airbnb, for example, even during the few times that they did it, was really praised because of how they handled their layoffs. So you don't want to go into it just to be like, "Hey, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say something bad about you," but you do have to remember that a brand 
does want to protect that because it truly defines how people in the future will want to come work for that company. So it's just something to remember exactly like you said, there is a negotiation, there is room, there's at least it's worth having that conversation. You don't have to accept the first offer. Sometimes it is like, hey, this is it. This is all we're doing. But it's at least worth having that conversation. Yeah. And Susan, I know you mentioned you didn't negotiate your severance package. Did you feel that was fair for you? Would you do it differently? I think it was all right for me. I did do my research and then it didn't seem to make a huge difference for me. I think at that time. And what did your research say? And how did you do your research for severance package? Yeah, so I looked up what was happening in the industry at the time. But then I think because a lot of the info is on larger companies, so it may or may not be relevant for, let's say, my region because I'm based in Canada. So then I found that just depending on folks that I talk to in the area that, you know, there are some companies where it might make more sense. For me, I think I could have tried, but then I just (laughs) wanted to, in the end, it didn't seem worth it for me to drag it out. But that's, of course, like I encourage people to look into their options. Yeah. Uh, It's interesting, Sundar, you mentioned the reputation of the company, especially with those viral clips from social media. You can see the CEOs of company taking the heat when their HR didn't handle it correctly. For example, there's a viral TikTok video of an ex-account executive from Cloudflare recently. She filmed the layoff conversation and posted. We don't know the full story, but in a video, it showed that The conversation was handled by HR who didn't know her work very well and gave her very vague reason uh, for the layoff. And she felt she wasn't treated fairly. So what do you think of that? So I I did see this one. And I think I think there's been much more uh, there's been growing call for transparency relating to, you know, work, HR issues or things like that, like salary transparency and whatnot. So I kind of see this as, as being part of that trend. I guess I'm personally not the type of person who would remember to even do something like that in the first place. Yeah, this one's a very interesting one because I don't know, it might be my age. You know, I'm 35 and (laughs) I've never in my life thought of doing it, but I don't blame the person, right? Like inherently, I think she was, from what I remember from the conversation, she was right to be frustrated, right? Like she had a manager who it sounded like had been giving her positive feedback. And I think the biggest mistake HR made there was they said it was because of her performance, right? I think, every, not everyone, but in, if you're in the tech world in this environment, you have to understand that layoffs are a very high likelihood. And and for so long, the full-time life has been built as this, this pillar of stability and great pay. And now all of a sudden mm-hmm. people are realizing There's an employment at will. And that means there's the flip side to it where now companies can, for whatever reason, let you go. So the the biggest mistake I think was on HR there from, again, my first viewing of the recording of saying it was a performance reason, because then that person immediately was trying to understand what justified that performance reason because she had not been receiving that. So again, to answer your question, though, would I tell my friend to do it? I think Susan's answer is spot on. Is a part of your brand... Is that part of you doing it to highlight some of the challenges working in tech, right? There's always context to why you posting. And even if you post it just because you're frustrated and angry, the most important thing for me as a friend would be, okay, but just understand there are potential consequences. Like while you might be getting people being like, yes, amazing, so proud of you, you also have companies that Mm -hmm. will double think for hiring you, right? And especially if you're in a sales role. So I think it's important to make sure in that heat of the moment where emotions are high, if you've recorded it and haven't posted it, great. Then take the time to truly think what is this play and be ready to handle the consequences. I Just another random example is whole Budweiser. Budweiser thought they were doing something good in their one yeah. ad campaign and it just completely backfired. And so similarly, you can't A-B test how a market is going to react, <laughs> right? And so, yeah. so you just have to accept, right? What is whatever happens? So I think that's, that is generally how I would talk to my friend. But I see both sides. I understand. I, I've been on both sides of layoffs and it's, 
Mm. Nobody enjoys it. There's nobody that wants yeah. to be doing it. So it's tough. It's very tough. Yeah. Oh, so you haven't been given the news of layoff for someone else? Yeah. No, I have. Yeah. 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 What was that like? I, I went to school for, I went to business school for undergrad. Yeah. And I think a really good thing that they teach you there, uh, it's just one class, but just like I- interview skills or negotiation, networking, all these skills, right? One of the things that I've really accepted is I try not to say I understand how you're feeling mm. because I don't. And yeah. and already that I think internally triggers a lot of people to be like, you don't. So right. the only way to, I mean, I just actually had to do it six months ago when I was at a client and there you kind of have to frame it from like the business strategy like, right, like there are the objective things that you know, well, it's the finances, the environment, or you have to try to remove the emotions from it. It's, yeah, again, it is it is the person's lowest point. And I think for them, what I've always said is you need to process it in your own way. I will be here during that entire process. And so this relationship doesn't need to also end right now, right? If in a week, you're like, hey, I've thought about it. I know what I want to do next. Can you help me network? Like you can bridge it and make it a human experience. And I think as a manager, that's important to recognize. It's a human at the end of it, even though the decision-making may have just been numbers. At the end of it, it was a human that you have to talk to. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Did you maintain the uh, friendship with your old bosses? How, what do you think about the relationship with your, the companies that, you know, laid you off? Yeah. Yeah. I have a very interesting perspective. Um, I will say that I did not have the best. And a lot of it is when you're that early at a company, you're joining it for the mission. It's not a financial decision. You're getting paid under market. There's very low chance that your equity is going to become something. You're doing it because mm-hmm. you enjoy the mission and, and you believe in what they're building. So at the time when both layoffs, I actually, you know, I was reasonable at the time. I try to be professional, but there's of course going to be frustration. And so for a year, I never really reached out to the founders. I never like, you know, I connected with some of the other people that I was working with that weren't the founders and I've got good relationships with them, but I never had a good relationship with it. I mean, I didn't have an interaction with the founders. And just like two weeks ago, I realized, you know, you never know where life is going to take you. Like we're in this for a very long time and most of us are in tech careers for probably another 20, 30 years. And I just wanted to repair that relationship. So I actually reached out to both founders to try to just reconnect and say like, hey, it's been a year. We've had a lot of distance. Like, you know, I'd love to just see how things are going at your company. I still care about the companies that they're at. I still am interested in what they're doing. So I've ended up repairing them. But yeah, at the moment... And it's also, I think, would be very different if I got laid off from like a large corporation. There, I'm just like, whatever, it's a transaction. Yeah. It's it's different when you're at a pre-seed and, and you're mm-hmm. a lot more emotional. I think. Yeah. I think it's been, I think, yeah, similar thing, which is there is my, there might have been some distance. But then I think because the companies that I was at, they were slightly larger. So then maybe it wasn't such a one-on-one relationship with the founders, but rather what was important for me is the relationship with my coworkers, actually. So regardless of what how I left a company, I find that the biggest network asset is actually all these ex-coworkers that are kind of, you know, all around in the tech world. So then I I definitely try yeah. to keep the relationship with all those fellow coworkers that I had in the past. So as for the relationship, yeah, because it's a larger company, so maybe there is less, I guess, friction there to keep in contact with the ex coworkers. But then, yeah, I, it wasn't like I was buddies with the founders or anything. So mm-hmm. then I guess I didn't have to uh, repair so much because uh, they probably didn't remember me super much anyway. So yeah, it was a, that was my situation. Add something to what Susan said, right? Your coworkers, they're not looking at you going, oh, you got laid off. You must've been a poor performer, right? Like they actually have a pretty, like they've already made up their own perspective of you. And there's always people at the company that everybody knows is a poor performer and why they're getting laid off. And that's a different, that's different. But if you're not, you know, I think there's a lot of stigma and shame to getting laid off. And it's like, what are my colleagues going to think? What are my fellow you know, people think, and having been on the place where I've seen, I mean, Uber went through a massive layoffs. 
you recognize it's a business decision more and, and you really look at the person and go, well, I had a really great time working with them. They produce good work. Sometimes you just got to cut some, you know, some amount. So I would encourage people that as they're going through that, it's normal to feel that shame and emotion. But to Susan's point, like try to, if you can maintain those relationships because they are a really powerful source of network because they have the most intrinsic, I mean, not intrinsic, they have the most like intimate working relationship with you. They were, they know exactly if you're a good worker or not, and they will vouch for you down the road. And I'm sure a lot of people, when they found their next job, often find them through referrals, network connection. So it is important to try to remember that as you go through the experience. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you felt shame or maybe blame yourself. And especially when it's a mass layoff, it says more about the employer than you. So how did you separate that your, you know, whether it's personal or whether it's about the company, how do you let go of that frustration? How do you handle the quote-unquote identity crisis? Susan, did you want to add something? Sure, yeah, I can go on. This one is definitely related to what I was thinking about, um, which is, I I think sometimes there is a slight benefit when there is maybe more people in the same boat, because I actually realized that there is actually people that are much smarter than me that were also in the same badge being let go. So then actually that made me feel more that, okay, it's not, I don't really have a like, <laughs> reputation at stake because they know that we're clearly very capable. These are the people we've worked with before. So then, of course, there was definitely some initial like regret feeling or like kind of shame feeling. But then I think just looking at everyone who's in the same boat, it's like, wow, this is like, everyone is really smart and I've worked with these people and we're in the same boat and like I would 100% vouch for them in any future role. So it's like, if this caliber of people are in the same boat as me, then it's like, wow, actually it's more, it's not personal. I think that was the conclusion I came to, which is, wow, like this is, yeah, I guess it's business. Yeah. What do you think, Sundar? Yeah. So sorry for this like long-winded spiel a little bit, but I think we as humans, when things go right, we give credit to everybody else. And when things go wrong, we tend to blame ourselves. At least that's what I think a lot of people do, and especially in layoffs like this. But you were the same person that had been doing good work and passed the interview and has had a successful career. Like all of a sudden, it can't be in my 13 year career where I've done really well all of a sudden I get laid off once and I'm now just a terrible employee. So like I've had this like mindset of just accepting if when things go well, a lot of it is because of me and it's not an ego thing, but it's just reality of like, you know, we all probably have done really good work and we should make sure we give ourselves the credit. Mm -hmm. When things go wrong, you're not all of a sudden a different person, right? There are so many different situations that, that cause these things to happen. And so I think I've just like, I, I'm a data scientist and I have to use data. And, you know, if I've got a really strong career for 10, 15 years, and then I have, you know, in the middle of the hardest funding time where things have just changed and there's a huge macro environment play and there's war, you have to be able to look at the data and say, okay, maybe it isn't me. And it's hard because I think we also always want control. And so we want to look at what we've controlled and what we do. But you have to be realistic and look and say, just yesterday, my coworkers were like, hey, I'm really happy you're here and you're doing great work. And then the next day you got laid off, right? Like, it, unless you, you've got a, a bunch of people telling you or your manager telling you you're not great work, you kind of have to step back sometimes and, and try to remove the emotion of it and try to remove the, yeah, just the, the self-control that you assumed you had. Yeah. Have you ever had a thought that crossed your mind? Oh, what if I have done this? Maybe I wouldn't get laid off. Yes. So early on, earlier in my career, right? So all, both of my layoffs, I think in a good way happened when I was 32, 33, 34, right? Like emotionally, I'm just a lot more mature. Professionally, I'm a lot more mature. I think when you're earlier in your career, this happens a lot for promotions and mm-hmm. opportunities, job interviews. You know, I can't count the number of times analysts are like, oh, I lost that interview. And it's like, well, yeah, but you also don't know what was going through the hiring managers. Maybe the hiring manager had a bad day or or maybe they really just were looking for someone else. And so 
I've thought about it a lot. Every time I, I don't get promoted, every time I didn't get an interview, I'm like, what did I do wrong? What could I fix? What could I fix? And you, and there are some things you should truly try to be self-reflective and improve. But yeah, there's just times where you have to, if, if you can't find something you did wrong, then you probably didn't do anything wrong. So, you know, it's important to remember that. Yeah. Susan, what about you? Have you ever had a thought? Yeah, I think actually what Sunder said was put it really well. So I think the way I used to think of it was more like, yeah, maybe there's a lot that I can change. And of course, like, it's good to be self-reflective. But then after the more I've worked, the more I realized for a lot of things that there's so many factors that are out of our control. It's kind of random, right? Like what Sunder mentioned about the interviews and like randomness of like, oh, hiring manager schedule or mood or I don't know, something about the resume or timing or for the layoffs as well, right? It's like timing and many other macro factors that are outside of myself. So yes, of course, I think if people had been getting consistently poor feedback, then maybe there's something they could have changed. But I think for a lot of folks who um, have experienced layoffs, that probably was not the case. Otherwise, they might have been like let go maybe earlier with other types of like, I don't know what the phrase is, but you know, they, they would have been like go some other way right? Instead of like, okay, in a group or in a whole org- organization or whatnot. So I think there's, it's good to self-reflect, but then overall, I think there's not so much to do to change the macro environment. Yeah. And I know you later uh, found a job as a principal data scientist. So what did you do to cheer yourself up? Did you take a break? Can you walk us through that phase? Yeah, so I think it's pretty important at the time for myself to relax and uh, maybe freshen up to get back into the interview. Because I think, you know, when people uh, get laid off, it's not really with, it's like maybe you, in hindsight, maybe it should have been expected with, let's say, the low interest rate period ending. But, you know, that's only in hindsight. So, of course, it was a surprise. So I wanted to kind of get my energy back up, like start preparing. It's not that I was preparing for anything before that, obviously, because it was a surprise. I hadn't been planning to leave. So I think it was most important to take care of myself, take care of my energy, so that when I actually start interviewing, then I'm at my best. But I, I did have the privilege of not needing to deal with, let's say, visa transfer or healthcare, for mm-hmm. example, being based in Canada. So then I did have the luxury to, you know, make sure my energy was all good before I jump right back in. Yeah. So how many months did you kind of rested before you get back to another full-time role? For me, I think I like to take one or two months off. So that's what I aimed for at the time. I think mm-hmm. two, one and a half months to maybe relax and then also just casually look around. So by that, I mean, it's not that when I'm looking, there's like the exact type of role I want, like just right there, right? It's for me, Mm -hmm. it's slowly looking so that when the openings actually come up, I'm there to notice that it's come up and then apply, right? But then it's not that at this point in time, when I look, everything is on the table for me. So I think it's more, yeah, Mm -hmm. resting and then waiting for any opening that actually suits me to come up over a longer period of time. Okay, so you slowly ease yourself back into the market. Uh, When you say slow, slowly look, what do you mean? Yes, yes, of course. So I think one, yeah, you did mention the case that I was more applying for, let's say, staff plus or or principal level role. So there's actually not so many openings at the time. So I've actually... And all the time, there's not so many openings. So my experience for applying to this type of role is actually just to look maybe more often and then see what's open. So for example, like at the time of the layoff, I open, let's say LinkedIn, there might be only three or four roles that are suitable. And then maybe after a Mm -hmm. week, I look, there is like maybe some that are posted. And then the next week I look, there is like a little bit more that have been posted. So that's what I mean by slowly, because I can't really mass apply. I can't just like send my resume to everything that fits, because I think that, first of all, there's not so many openings for this type of role. Second of all, I think they're not really, for me, selecting a staff plus level requires understanding a lot about the team before applying. It's more like maybe, I wouldn't say specialized, but 
I have to really understand the team. So that's where the networking comes in. Like if I really wanted mm-hmm. to, if somewhere really looked at thing, I would usually like to talk to the hiring manager first. I actually did that for, I applied for th- three roles and I got, I guess, two offers and I withdraw from one of them. So I talked to all three hiring managers of those. So I think this was more kind of like a sniper. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably a bad analogy, but just like more like a high accuracy low spamming (laughs) kind of strategy that I took. I don't know if I was answering the question or not. Yeah, that's the networking to understand the team and then slowly so that I could understand the role that I'm getting into. Yeah. So when you talk to the hiring manager, did you figure out who are they and then message them on LinkedIn? Or did you ask the recruiters to introduce you to the hiring manager? Yes, this is a very good question. Let me think about this real quick. I think I actually knew all of them before. (laughs) So okay, my advice, this is really hard to first engineer. My advice is to just slowly build up the network. So this is actually the benefit of building up a network over years and years and years, because these are people I knew. I met them once or twice. I talked to them once, maybe twice at some conference or through some previous coworkers, their previous coworkers acquaintance. And I talked to them one time, but this is all through like years and years of building it up. So I want to say just invest in the network like slowly over the years. And the investment is not going to have a payoff immediately. It's not like, oh, I met this hiring manager tomorrow. They're going to offer me a job. It's I met this hiring manager three years ago and we talked one time. That's the result. Like that's where this came into play is years after. So I think it's really hard to reverse engineer this unless someone starts early. Yeah. So that's my advice to the listeners, which is build it up early and not last minute. And especially with the current environment, even if you have a secure job, think about this early, maybe reach out to... I guess maybe you you don't have to, you don't have to do this, but maybe I think it's helpful to just run that scenario in your head. Okay, what happens if I get laid off tomorrow? What is something I can do today to say network with some hiring managers or talk to your peers just to see what they're doing out there? Maybe they're just better job opportunities. Maybe you need a change. So I think that's a great advice. Sundar, is there anything you want to add? No, and, uh, but I, I think the network one is a really good point. And, and even for my consulting business, like most of my leads are going to come from my network. And just keeping that network alive, and, but doing it for the right reasons, right? Like having like actual engaging conversations, truly caring about what they're working on, reaching out to people because you're just interested in catching up is it's a really important skill set. And I think most of the successful people at like the very top CEOs, that level, they're all just really good networkers and they have really strong, powerful networks. And it's an obvious skill that, you know, is very important for business. So I, I, yeah, I would totally echo the con I mean, the connection thing. And I think for me, when I got laid off twice, it was the first time in my entire career, I actually had a time to pause and reflect. I think we're so conditioned to, okay, I found my next job. Yes, I might take a month off. But like, I suddenly had just like, okay, you don't actually have a next step in your career. Like, you know, what do you truly want to do? And so for for me, I, I ended up taking three whole months, really like having conversations and just kind of just thinking through like what I enjoyed about work and what my priorities were too ended up being a very important thing for me to discuss. And at the time, my son was, I think, six months old. And I just realized like I cared so much more about time with him and my wife that full-time life was not for me. I was going to put in 40 to 60 hours a week for a company that it just ended up being something that I didn't want to do. And I was also looking at the job market. It was super tough. And no job was actually surprisingly interesting to me. I kind of looked and I just thought, I don't want to interview. I don't want to do any of this. So it actually ended up being a really powerful self-reflective moment to kind of say, listen, you no longer have any conditions. What do you really want to do? The flip side is, of course, the risk of the finances and you know how the mental health. But it was... I think getting laid off was honestly the best thing that happened to me. 
Yeah, it sounds like it's a freeing moment for you to learn more about what you like. I think I just want to add to that point too. Like, I think it was a really good reset moment, like self reflection moment. I think we don't get that enough. Yeah, because I mean, we we all have really intense jobs, and then we come back home, and you know, you don't really have a time to think. And on the weekends, you're like, I want to, I don't want to think about work, and so you don't really ever get a chance to pause and self reflect until you're like, okay, well, I've got nothing to do today, and to Susan's point, I also took like the first few weeks and just sort of relaxed. But then at some point, you kind of have to look at it as a gift if you can, if you're able to, and just say, what can I, do? I can't change that I got fired, but I can take advantage of the time that I now have that I would have never had before. So, yeah. Uh, so you were doing growth analytics at pre seed stage startups. So, what'd you learn from that experience? Would you? Join those companies again? No, and it's mainly because it's just too early for analytics and experimentation. You know, the founders have a vision; they really want to go try to find product market fit, and they've kind of got an idea of what they want that to look like, right? Eventually, the only reason companies pivot is because they're sort of forced to, and they have no other choice. But until you get to that choice, usually you're like, I want to do this. I really want to go try to build this. And you know, a really great example is one of the first travel company. The, the first company was a travel company, and we want to do everything app-based. And as an analytics person, I was like, well, our funnel would be like 10x more efficient if we just did everything through the web, because you don't have to then download the app. You don't have to, you know, there's conversion rates. And yeah, it, it was just, you know, it took them a year and a half, but they eventually just went mainly through web after I left. But right, these are things you suggest as an analyst, and it's kind of hard to do that. But it's, it's a great experience. If you're an analyst, I think there's no better place than a startup, especially for me personally, a marketplace startup is like a haven for, sorry, having, I guess, more for data analysts, data scientists, but try to wait till their series A, let them already find product market fit, get a little stability, and then you can go add value to. I think that's the most important part. So I would not personally go to a pre-seed or seed, pre-seed or seed stage startup if you're a data scientist. Yeah, because first you have to have data. And if they say, if the company do need to find someone with an analytical mind, what do you think is the right job role for that position? Yeah. The, so whether you're hiring an operations person or even your P or even maybe your engineer, someone at this point, I'm hoping in your company knows a bit of SQL. And it doesn't yeah. have to be complex SQL. You're not really running anything that crazy, right? So as long as... First off, before you even run SQL, it's whether you even have a decent <laughs> like a table. <laughs> so that's the first thing is I encourage companies to just set up a base level of a data ta data warehouse. And then, yeah, just, I mean, just have somebody on the team that's remotely analytical, go take a SQL course for like a week or two. But, yeah. Or you can hire someone fractional for a day a week, but I uh, just don't hire someone full time. I think for even for the company, it's not a good investment. Yeah, yeah. Or if you join a pre-seed company as a full-time data scientist, I think you can still join if you really like the product, you like the mission, and you're open to step into other roles. Maybe say for six months, your role is more like a data engineer or product manager or AI person. If you're okay with that, that might be, yeah. you know, still be a good fit for you. But if you are, want to do something very specific like you for, you know, growth analytics, maybe that's not a good fit. And also, I think it's interesting for machine learning, right? Similarly, you have to have data. So Susan, when you pay companies to join, do you consider the size of the companies when you think about you know, job security or just the quality of data they have for your projects? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I actually had a kind of when I try to explain like what data scientists do to people, I mentioned that you would be doing data engineering if you're at a startup <laughs> or like you might be doing some data engineering at yeah. a startup. I think for myself, I when I'm looking for roles, I think it's more effective if they already yeah have a lot of the core like strategy around the data and like what they want to do machine learning on and like what's it for. But I've also been, I'm also happy to help shape that or how do I put it like I'm happy to 
put my expertise to recommend what companies do with their data, right? But then they still need to first have their kind of main, even higher level strategy. And also they need to have the trust in the data person. Because I've definitely heard from other people that I know in the field where they might hire someone and they're saying, oh yeah, we want to do this and this with the data, but they don't trust um, this early stage data person enough to actually implement those things. Or they will take the recommendations and they don't really want to implement it or they won't, it doesn't really fit into their strategy. They're kind of doing it to do it. So I think myself, I personally try to avoid those situations at for the time being. But actually, like, there are some good points that um, Sunder and you have mentioned, too, which is like, it might depend on the stage of the company, but it also depends a bit on maybe like the life stage as well, right? Because I think earlier in my career, I'm very, it's like, (laughs) easier to go from place to place and learn a lot. And then I think I go between stages of more, I want to build something more long term and then stages of like fast iteration. Like it just um, takes it takes turns like every few years, maybe there's like a it depends on the mood. So I think that's one thing. Yeah. So if you want to give data scientists looking for machine learning roles, some advice, how to evaluate companies and teams, what are some parameters they should look into? Yeah, I think I will ask in interviews if they work, if they have data engineers on the team. That's one big question I'll ask. And like, how often do you collaborate? And what's an example of past collaboration that you had with the data engineering Mm -hmm. team? Or let's say, do you have ML infrastructure? Do you have ML engineers or ML ops engineers? So then I'll ask that and then how they collaborate. And on the flip side, like we've also had a lot of candidates who we hire, they ask us that because I can, I know that they're trying to gauge how our team is in terms of the maturity. So yeah, that's definitely my method and it's pretty effective. So when you were interviewing those roles, I get that the hiring managers already have a relationship with you, but when you had those conversations with HR, did they ask you, oh, what is the reason you got laid off? Did you feel you need to prepare like a story or narrative? I think I was lucky because at the time, the general industry had that. So I I think just like on the hiring side, I can't, I, I believe the HR was actually used to getting candidates that were laid off. So I think it was, I was fully transparent, I think. The hiring managers knew there was no reason to really keep it in in a secret because I think nowadays when I interview people got laid off, I'm just like, wow, this is just one of hundreds, thousands of people. Uh, Like it's not actually even new anymore when I, when someone mentions that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just that myself too, I imagine they were thinking that also. So a lot of CEOs justify the mass layoff by citing, oh, there was a pandemic, hiring binge, high inflation or weak consumer demand. This is a quote I saw from NPR. So why do you think the current layoff happened? Do you think it's related to... AI. I'm just trying to think like I I actually think the I'm not super sure regarding like AI because I think people still need domain knowledge. It's kind of similar to when let's say Google search engine (laughs) got big and then when there were more and more tools to automate things but then we still need people who have that domain expertise or even like just deeper machine learning or data expertise to actually run these questions by generative AI, because I think even when I'm using it, like I often have to correct it a lot. Like it just does not, just like for more complex scenarios, it doesn't really work out of box. It takes like an expert to be able to tweak it, to do exactly what we need domain specific. And I think I had a quick analogy about this for interviews because someone actually asked me like oh is this going to change interviews I know it's not about the role displace displacement but let's say there's some overlap there right so I think my analogy there was that oh when the google let's say when people started being able to just google answers right like people the interview still went on right it's not that oh we forbid you from using google we we just let them do it if they're good at googling then good for them right <laughs> like if they're good at using these tools and apps and they're able to react to different scenarios and apply it to actually specific scenarios like domain specific scenarios then 
I guess that's fine. But usually if they're just blindly using it, then they cannot react well. And they would, that's the same as if they were bad at Googling, right? Like they just can't react to the answer. So I think to the point about AI, I, I don't think it's like at the point where it's totally it's not the same as the layoffs we had from, of course, like the growing interest rate environment, but I think it's maybe at a small scale at then. But maybe the numbers say otherwise. And if so, then maybe it's just like a lagging, lagging indicator of all these, the interest rates. Yeah. Susan, you wrote a book about machine learning interviews. And now with the more gen AI tools or code writing systems, would you see the shift in machine learning engineer interview process? I don't really know about the folks who are working specifically on Gen AI apps, but I think people are still using very general interview loops. So even though maybe they're hiring someone called data scientist and they're working on generative AI, the interview loop would still consist of, it's not going to be 100% related to generative AI in gen, like I, I want to say that's the case. The reason being that, um, let's say we're hiring people over three months, right? We want to generally keep the questions the same, um, not keep changing it. Like let's say this week we change it, next week we change it, because that's not the not, not fair for the candidate. So we're not gonna just change all the interview questions to related to generative AI. But if there already are questions related to uh, large language models or NLP that have been around for a long time. Like I, I know hiring managers who are asking about BERT came out in late 2018 because it still powers a lot of the um, large language models we use to this day. So the interview questions might actually just be the same that time. So I think it's still important to have a grasp of the basics. And then if they've built side projects in the newer um, Gen AI technologies, then that's going to be great for the kind of resume deep dive as well as maybe scenario questions that ask about, let's say you want to build this Gen AI app, what would you do? Then that's great for that. But then I think there are still foundational questions that I've seen that just are more, uh, they're kind of the same. They're not totally changing. Yeah. I saw on Reddit, a lot of people say they were laid off a couple of months ago. They struggled to find new full-time roles. So for both of you, do you have friends who are looking for jobs, been for a while and still couldn't find a role? I don't, from what I can think off the top of my head, I've got a very lucky group of friends. I think me too, actually. Like most of them have found other employment or all that I know off the top of my head. So I think maybe again, it's like lucky. Yeah. Do you in general feel data science teams are getting leaner? That's a good question. I think... Well, I think the ones, the teams that have experienced uh, layoffs have definitely gotten leaner because I guess the headcount reduced. But actually what I've seen mm -hmm. is I was speaking to another industry friend and their team is hiring. Our team is hiring some other people we know. Their teams used to have a hiring freeze and now <laughs> they're we're like loosening the hiring freeze. So then I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. things are coming back. I don't want to quote yeah. entire industry, but just like yeah, I think yeah. maybe slightly coming back yeah i think certain parts of the industry are but i think in general weirdly enough companies are becoming less data driven i think just data science and data analytics teams have not always done the best job of suggesting what their value is so you'll see a lot of those teams get cut because companies think they're a cost center they're not impactful and so they cut them and yes, you get t co companies that are working on machine learning and AI that truly understand the value of a data scientist, and so they will hire them. But I think at a global level, yeah, I think it'll it won't be the same way it was before. I think what will happen is the best data scientists, data analysts will get hired, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of data analysts that are candidly not good. And I think that the pace at which they were hired before is not going to be there. For example, if I'm a data analyst and I struggle to find a job and also thinking about career transition, what are some other career paths I can consider? So I think the challenge for data analysts has been that they don't realize or they didn't realize that data analytics and data science is actually a business function. 
your whole job is to provide value to the business. And yet a lot of them enjoy building dash or, <laughs> or ETO work. And there's nothing wrong with this stuff, but that yeah. is not actually a data analyst job. So mm-hmm. what I think what will end up happening is a lot of them will transition to these more specialized roles that are in line with what they enjoy doing. So analytics engineer, data engineer, maybe BI engineer, BI developer, right? There's there's a host of them. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the challenge with the data role is a data science can be anything. A data analyst can be any, it's a, such a wide range. And I think what will happen is companies will get smarter on what their actual needs are. And so data professionals will get smarter with what they actually want to do in the data field. So there's a, ho- there's a host of, I mean, analytics engineers, data engineers, ML ops, ML engineers, like it's a, like, there's a, that's a very hot, hot in demand, well-paying job rate. So you, you can definitely take advantage of that. Yeah, that's a great point. So find a specific niche and go into that if you are interested in the technical aspect of things. And if you are more interested in the business, maybe you can become a product leader, a product manager, a product designer. And with that experience in data, that also give you an edge compared to other product managers. So now, because of this experience of being laid off, how does it change your perspective of full-time employment and job security? Susan, maybe you want to share some of your perspective. I know you also previously have your you not previous, sorry, you still have your gaming company. So you kind of already dabble something on the side. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, let's see, I think it's still for myself, just my scenario, my considerations that full time is pretty valid or pretty valuable, I think, because for a lot of the data things that I work on. I think I was talking to a friend about this uh, the other day, actually. So the gaming studio is my hobby, (laughs) I guess, even though, yeah, I do make some small amount of income, but it's not enough to replace my full-time income for the amount that I want to spend, (laughs) let's say. So for me, the reason why I chose to keep that part-time is because it's good. It's something I can do more solo or with a small team, right? But for a lot of the huger machine learning initiatives I like to work on and I have been working on, it requires the work of a pretty big team right? Like we talked about the data engineers, like ML ops, create infrastructure. This is really hard to do as a hobby by myself, unless I, yeah, like I think Sandra has more to talk about, like on the consultant side, but just like for myself as an IC, these are the things I contribute to. And then it does require the work of a team. So that's, I think that's why for me, going back into full-time makes sense. And then I think regarding the stability and whatnot, I, I do think that, yeah, like with the networking, I think let's say this does happen again, I do feel more confident that I can still remain competitive because of the kind of network I've built up over the years, the track record, um, the delivery of projects I've built up over the years, that's not going to go away. So I think for folks who are looking to stay competitive, I do think, yeah, network and continuing to learn. I think that's one thing that also maybe sets myself apart, which makes me more confident about remaining in full-time employment is just continuing to learn, right? Even though I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, like there is no, no no one like saying, hey, you need to learn more about the this new field, right? Like the ML field is changing so much all the time. So I'm always learning. I'm always going to new conferences, speaking at new conferences on different new topics, I think for candidates who do that, like there is a good chance that um, full time can stay viable. And if they want to do consultancy or kind of be, be their own boss, then it'll help them stay competitive in the exact same way. Right. So just stay ahead of the new advancements. It does require time and energy. So I do also have to purposely mine my energy so that I can spend time with my family still so i think it's like on it's like very it's not an accident right it's not accident that i can do both i i would say i think a lot of people who really enjoy working with large complex systems you kind of have to have a full-time job or even working for that scale of company to feel uh, fulfilled and i think most 
common type of independent consultant are, for example, Sundar on the analytics growth side, when the data size is relatively smaller compared to machine learning projects, or I've seen independent data engineers or architects, I think they can quickly implement a pipeline. But uh, machine learning is really a team store, team sport. So Sundar, you have been doing consulting for a while. So what was your experience? What were some um, challenges you faced when you had this transition? Yeah. And just to add a comment to Susan's, I think for most people, full-time is the right choice. And it's still the most stable choice, right? It's maybe not as stable as it was before, but I think also we're always a cycle. Economies have cycles. And so we're probably in the lowest point and eventually gets a little bit more stable again. So it's important to still recognize relatively it's still the most stable choice. For me, the transition, you know, I announced that I was consulting in March after taking a few months to decide what I want to do. And I was able to find my first client a few weeks later through my first, my old manager at Uber. So I've had a very unique and I think somewhat lucky experience. And then that client ended up being my client for nine months. So like I had one client for nine months. I was there four to five days a week, found them very quickly. Now that I've pivoted more to experimentation consulting, I'm kind of not necessarily restarting, but I am rebuilding and having more of these conversations. So, cause I have a very specific service that I now offer than before. The biggest challenge is focus. I mean, I had so many ideas and I wanted to do so many things and I tried to do all of them. And I kind of just realized like we, you know, Dolly and I actually talked about this and it's like, it's so exhausting. (laughs) You have to focus, right? You have to focus yourself. The, The second thing is if you, especially when you do consulting, you have to sell and you've never, I've never had to sell you kind of have to, you sell, you have to sell a work, but it's a different type of selling. So it's just a skill set though. And it's a skill set that I've never had that I now have to work on. I have to build up. And as long as I take a long-term approach and say, listen, over time, I can get better at it. I'm fine. I don't want to put pressure and say, I have to figure out selling tomorrow, but full, so the solopreneur route is the only route that I see where you can actually choose how much you want to work. So full-time is great. And you get a a stable income for that, but you can never really decide you want to go down to 10 hours this month and then 20 and then 40, right? I can, and that's okay. And so I could just say, listen, I've worked six months this year. I've made enough for this year and I just don't want to work six months. Mm -hmm. So that's the trade-off is it it, it comes with flexibility, but you do have to earn that flexibility, right? I I still have to make and find consulting projects for the first six months to do that. But uh, yeah, I guess the biggest challenges to answer your question were learning to focus myself, learning to sell. Um, Otherwise, that's it. I I actually have found that I get the best of what I enjoyed with full-time life, which was I really enjoyed coming in, doing projects, like, you know, focusing on something for three to six months, creating some great results and then moving on. And that's exactly what I get to do in my consulting business. So mm-hmm. the the thrill of just changing and working with new clients, new projects, new industries, that's something I enjoy, but it's not for everybody. Like my wife, for example, is like, I, she's like, I hate the first three months at a job because you have to like prove yourself. You have to build your mm-hmm. network and your reputation. And I, on the other hand said, that's my favorite part. You just get to jump, jump in and, and just sort of make impact. And so, yeah, you kind of have to, f- feel if it's the right fit for you. But I always felt something was missing for me in full time because I couldn't work on the next interesting project and I couldn't just jump and I couldn't change jobs every three months, six months. That is my job now. Yeah. You need that variety. That's important for you. And uh, for people who are in a full-time position, What's your advice if they want to reduce the risk of this full-time employment, for example, from the perspective of financial stability, skill set, mindset, identity? And sounds like both of you have invested in time speaking in conferences or write online to build your uh, personal brand. Susan, what's your best advice? So the question is to how to maintain stability. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you mentioned the conference speaking and writing. Definitely agree with those points. Another point for sure is I recommend the networking. And Sunder actually, one one thing I got from Sunder's question just now is that after the kind of layoff and becoming a consultant, your first engagement came from network, right? So like regardless of what happens, your next job, whether it's a solo or a full time could just come from your network. And I think that's one big thing that I've gained from my previous employers is that every time I move from somewhere, there's like this huge alumni network, right? And they just move to different companies that now I have somewhere that I have a network there in whatever, wherever they go to. So I think getting to really know people is one way of, of I guess, maintaining career stability. And of course, the learning new skills, seeing what comes up, being genuinely excited in learning about new skills and not getting caught off guard is also important. I was just going to say, in terms of reducing risk, one, I think you have to find what you're truly passionate about. Uh, Susan, it sounds like you know, you've got this like, gaming project on the side that sounds really interesting. I'm, I'm assuming it's a passion of yours. And the second thing is, no matter what, you have to be comfortable selling. So whether it's selling on LinkedIn through her own brand or creating that brand or doing side projects with consultancy, I think a lot of people shy away from that, but you there you have to put in the work to reduce that risk. And that work really comes through selling yourself in some way, promoting yourself, you know, figuring out that. And so you just it's a mindset shift, I would say. So if you really want to reduce your risk, find your passion and then go figure out how to sell yourself. That's like my two simplest pieces of advice. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel selling yourself, you have to be uh, cringy online or you have to be super extroverted. I think maybe you can just start with sharing an idea you feel very passionate about or something you disagree with a lot of people with. Maybe you can just write your post or blog post for just one person and imagine how helpful it is for them. So it's more about them, less about you. So this can reduce some fear and also kind of take out the ego aspect of it. Uh, I think right now there are more and more tech employees and leaders who want to build their personal brand. Going to plug in my own services. I've been advised a lot of tech startup founders on how to build a personal brand. If you want to learn more about how to write on LinkedIn, how to tell a story, you can email me at daliana at dalianaliu.com. I also have a form in the show notes if you want to reach out. So before we wrap up, do you have any other advice for data scientists regarding you know, how to handle layoffs? career transitions? I think the one thing I would say is think about the financial impact of what a layoff will do to you and sort of prepare for that mentally before. I mean, right now, the reality is you never know when you're, who is going to get laid off. So kind of just go through the exercise, whether you have a partner or by yourself, just sort of mentally think that through so that if the time comes, and I hope you know it never does, you're at least prepared for it. So you're not having to scramble in that moment to prepare. Just do the exercise to think through, do you have the right finances? Do you have the right runway? What would you mentally do? Kind of make a plan and then just hope you never have to plan and use it. Yeah. Could you elaborate on like how to calculate your runway? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I'm not a financial advisor, so disclaimer, mm-hmm. but I think just take your general expenses and build a three to six month rainy fund. If you can save towards that, you know, try to reduce your credit card debt as much as possible. That's all you need to do. Just keep it simple, get a rough number and just save towards that if you can. Yeah, I think agree with that. Just prepare. I, I think, you know, I'm personally like a bit of a finance, personal finance nerd a little bit. So then I, mm-hmm. I kind of had that all set up at the time this happened. So then I definitely felt more ready, less scrambling. So I, def- I definitely recommend people to think about it. Think about just like your finances, what would happen if you got laid off or if something else happened that would kind of reduce your income stream, right? So things like that. One other thing I wanted to point out was just like, We work in data, right? So this is all a probability. There's no job that's going to be, it's not safe or not safe. It's more about 
-hmm. there's a higher probability of this happening or there's a lower probability, but non-zero probability. So always be prepared. (laughs) That's the way I was seeing it. And that's what I recommend people see it. Like there's no, it's not safe. Not binary. There. Yeah. You mentioned you already set up your finance, maybe projection, maybe you have some simulation. So for folks who has never done this before, what are some online resources you recommend or where should they get started? I'm curious to see what Sunder has to say. I think personally, if someone's getting started, just like really track like how much you're spending in one month, like just look at your past like three to six months expenditures look at that, just calculate exactly how much it is, multiply that by six, that's your rough Mm -hmm. rainy day fund or your six month runway or one year runway. For people who are more nerdy, I recommend this thing called Projection Lab. It can simulate like run simulations of like, if their interest rate is this much and you save this much, if your mortgage is this much, or if you get fired, what can you do? But it's not, you know, it's not prescribing you what to do. It's like you have to tell it what you're uh, run projections on your own scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I recommend. I think it's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I haven't used projection labs, but I would, the calculation she said for the baseline six month expe- uh, expenses, I think is that's enough for everybody. <laughs> Yeah. And for folks who, who want to also consider becoming a independent consultant or maybe just doing it part time, what's your advice, Sundar? What's that very first step? Just talk to your network. Put yourself out there. Let people mm-hmm. know you're thinking of doing it. It's, you can't be a, be a consultant if nobody knows you're a consultant. So yeah, just yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I really like the email. I just got an email this morning. I think you send out the email to your network. I'm pretty sure it's not personalized. You can say hi, Diana, but kudos to you making that first step launching your website. Yeah. So I also know my friend become a career coach. I asked him, where did he find his first client? He said, I'll just post it on Facebook because those are the people you already know, and they hired him as a coach. This is a fun conversation, a little bit of a heavy topic, but I think we got a lot of value for our audience. Thanks again, Sundar and Susan. Yeah, thanks for having us, Diana. This is, I know it's a tough conversation, but I think it's a necessary one. So I'm glad you were able to do this. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hope the convo can help listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.